from Caddis Island County Park. My name is Megan Zorn, Senior Park Naturalist, and we're here today at our raised bog garden. So a bog is essentially a wetland that has lots of dead plant material built up. Um, namely in the pine barrens, that dead plant material is sphagnum moss. Um, if you saw German's great presentation from Wells Mills Park, where he showed some of the industries that used to go on in the pine barrens, he grabbed a clump of that sphagnum and you could see how much water it holds. So bogs are very, very wet. And that sphagnum, when it breaks down, we call it peat. So that's what we have in our, our bog garden here. Um, a garden like this wouldn't be naturally occurring at a place like at a place like Haddis Island Park because it's simply too salty here. So instead, we've created this great raised bed to kind of give the plants their own little micro habitat. So the way this is set up, um, we've got a pool liner lining all of the the inside here. There's a layer of sand on the bottom, and on top there's a layer of about 50. 50 um, peat sand mixture to, to mimic the acidic soils of a bog. And we also have a drip irrigation system that's on a timer. It goes off every 20 minutes, night and day. That's because it needs to stay very wet. Um, so, you know, we've got lots of different plants here. We even have some cranberries growing. Take a look at all of these great plants. And the plants are what make bogs special. Um, so, we actually have carnivorous plants growing in here. We have a couple of different species. Now, you might think it's a little odd for a plant to be carnivorous because a carnivore eats meat, right? Um, so plants are supposed to be at the bottom of a food chain. But of course, nature likes to make exceptions to every single rule. And this is one of those scenarios. Um, so carnivorous plants can be found all over the, all over the world. There's lots of different kinds. Um, and they've been around since prehistoric times. Um, and they've been found you know, all the way back in the fossil records. Um, so here we have a purple pitcher plant. Now you might be familiar with um, Audrey too, if you little shop of horrors or maybe if you're young one of our younger viewers you might play super mario brothers and you know piranha plant so those are all modeled after real life carnivorous plants thankfully not as large um, we don't have any plants that can consume something the size of a human there are certain species that can um, consume something as large as a mouse but here in the uh, pine barrens of new jersey um, our carnivorous plants eat insects so this is our purple pitcher plant right here you can see the beautiful colors, and this isn't even as vibrant as they will as they will grow. Um, we actually throw some, um, you know, evergreen clippings over them over the winter to kind of insulate them um, as they hibernate because they do go through a stage of dormancy in the colder months. Um, but if you look really closely here, I'm not sure if the camera will pick this up. I'm going to come on around. You can see on the inside of these pitcher plants, there's that opening, that's how they get their name, shaped like a pitcher. And eating insects is a way for them to get the nutrients that they don't get from the nutrient poor soils that they grow in. So they're able to absorb the nutrients from those bugs and inside these little fuzzy hairs. They, don't, they won't hurt me, kind of feels like fuzz. But when an insect crawls in, they're attracted to the sweet smelling nectar inside of there. And they'll crawl in and those little downward facing hairs are going to prevent them from easily crawling back out. So then they have digestive enzymes in that same nectar and that's going to digest the insect and they'll be able to absorb the nutrients from that bug. And over here, You'll see there's a couple of different varieties in this garden. You'll have to forgive me because I'm not sure exactly what variety they are. Um, botanists are able to create all sorts of really interesting hybrids of these pitcher plants. They can come in um, you know, variations of greens to these dark purples and maroons. And you can see they have these really cool patterns and striations on them. But this is a taller variety. Um, so you can see some of them aren't even open yet. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, the importance of that. But in a plant like this, this will eventually open up. So when a bug is attracted to that sweet smell, it's going to crawl all the way down and there will be a flap on top. Let me see if I can find one. If we come over to this plant, you can see that flap a little bit better. So here's one that's starting to open up. So this flap will prevent it from getting clogged up with larger objects. The insect will be able to crawl down and you can imagine being stuck inside something that tall and smooth that's going to be hard to climb back out. 
Now we have one other type. It's very little. Here we go, right in the center here. We've got an itty bitty cute little Venus flytrap. So Venus flytraps are not native to New Jersey. They grow in the wetlands of North Carolina, but it's a similar enough environment where we can grow these flytraps in our bog garden. So it's still very little, and all of the ones that are closed probably um, have a little bug inside that they're digesting. So they have a sweet smelling nectar, um, just like the pitcher plants, and the bugs will crawl along the outside. And as they're investigating that smell, these Venus fly traps have little trigger hairs on the inside, kind of like a mouse trap. So when the fly presses on that trigger, um, it's going to bend the hair and it's going to cause the trap to close, like two hands with the fingers interlacing. So they won't be able to escape from there and the plant will stay closed for sometimes up to two weeks until that bug is fully digested and the nutrients are absorbed. Now, I'm not going to trigger this because it will remain closed and it won't be able to, to capture um, the insects. Now, carnivorous plants don't necessarily need insects to survive. Um, they are able to photosynthesize just like all other plants, um, but the insects help them to grow big and strong, if you will. Definitely helps them reach their full, their full potential. All right, so I've got a couple of other species for you. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, so since they have all of these ways of attracting insects to them, um, they need to also attract pollinators. So each time of year, between May and June, they start to grow their, their flowers. And they're kind of weird flowers. They're not totally open yet. They're kind of leafy rather than your typical flower that you'd think of. But when they open up, they're going to attract pollinators. So pollinators are kind of in danger when they approach a carnivorous plant. So these plants need a way to keep those pollinators safe, like bees and butterflies. So the way that this grows, it's so tall and far away from the trap portion of the plant that it keeps, usually, it keeps the bees and the butterflies from falling into the traps. And we've actually discovered that insects can see um, different light spectrums than the human eye can perceive. So if you were to put an ultraviolet light up to a purple pitcher plant and several other species, the rim of the plant will actually glow blue. So the insects are kind of seeing this plant like a landing pad and that's attracting the prey species to the plant. And the bees are attracted to the, the flower portion of the plant. And that's how they reproduce. So there's a couple of other species of um, carnivorous plants that you'll find in the Pine Barrens. So I want you guys to be familiar with these. And I um, encourage you to, to look these up on your own because I don't have the best images for you. I apologize. But we do have three varieties of sundews that you can find in the Pine Barrens. Wells Mills County Park is a great place to see these. So if you're walking along that white trail that parallels the lake, you can see them in the cedar swamps there and on the lake itself. So this is a thread-leafed sundew. You can see it gets its name from the shape. And sundews work a little differently than the plants we've seen here. So you can see all of these little hairs that are on the leaves. And at the end of those hairs are sticky bits of sap, which also smell very tasty to the insects. So they will get stuck to these little hairs and then the, the thread is going to kind of curl around that insect and digest it. And you can see here, this has a, a more typical looking flower that grows on these plants and it will also grow nice and high above the, the trap part of the plant to keep the pollinator insects safe. Now I've actually seen these in action. So I, I used to work at Wells Mills Park and I was paddling on, on a canoe on the lake and the sundews were growing there. And I actually found a pair of dragonflies that had been caught in these sundews. So they, they are quite sticky. <laughs> Try to battle with the wind here, give me one second. So another variation is this round leaf sundew really the only difference is the shape it works in the same way and that little spoon if you will will curl around an insect after it's been stuck and then we have the third variety here which is called a spatula leafed sundew you can see all those little droplets look very tasty and inviting and the only difference here is that the the shape is well shaped more like a spatula it's a little bit longer and one last variety of 
carnivorous plants that you might see in the Pine Barrens actually grow in the water. This is called a bladderwort, kind of a funny name. So you'll see these growing in a lake, a freshwater lake. So you can see that flower again is nice and high above the trap portion of the plant, which is actually underwater. So underwater, they have bladders, little, little sacks filled with water, and then little aquatic insects or um, fish or even tadpoles will swim up to that bladder and then they will hit the little trigger hairs, a trap door will open and the bladder is going to suck up that insect or that fish and it's going to digest it so it can have the nutrients it needs to grow. Um, all right, well, thank you for joining us to check out our carnivorous plants today. Um, Friday, we are going to be back here at Caddis with Nikki Vernaccio and she's going to introduce you guys to our snapping turtles. If you have any questions, um, just leave them in the comments section. My name is Megan Zorns and thanks for joining us.